In January this year, a big rally was held in Davao City, the second largest city in the Philippines. It was billed as a prayer meeting, but there was a lot more swearing, sexy dancing and threats than you traditionally see at a prayer meeting. Also, no actual religious leaders were present. The mayor of Davao City, Bas Duterte, was the first to talk. And the whole thing kind of became a sort of a roast of the current president of the Philippines, Bongbong Marcos. Bas Duterte called on President Bongbong Marcos to resign. On top of that, he seemed to threaten Marcos and his family by reminding him of leaders who were famously murdered. From now on, before you go to bed, think of the Romanovs, Benito Mussolini and his wife. And maybe you'll reconsider the direction that you are taking. Then, Bast's dad, Rodrigo, who used to be the president, suggested that Bongbong Marcos was addicted to cocaine. Bongbong Marcos, my drug addict tayo na presidente, putang inang yan. This all, understandably, made news across the Philippines, and it turned into a bit of a finger-pointing tit-for-tat between the current and former presidents. Marcos said that Duterte was out of his mind because he's addicted to prescription painkillers. I think it's the fentanyl. Uh, fentanyl is the strongest painkiller that you can buy. I hope his doctors be take better care of him. This is all pretty unedifying stuff. A bit reminiscent of what's going on in America at the moment with Biden and Trump. But here's the wild part. Duterte's family and Marcos's family are intricately linked. Sometimes they're rivals, sometimes they're allies. They are the Montagues and Capulets of the Philippines. They are, depending on who you ask, the country's most famous statesmen, thieves, murderers or heroes. The Marcoses and Dutertes have tussled for power for nearly 60 years. And now the Dutertes are suggesting they might make their home island of Mindanao a separate country. Today, the story of the feud literally threatening to tear the Philippines apart. I'm Matt Bevan, and this is If You're Listening. The entanglement of these two families goes back generations. It was 1965, and Ferdinand Marcos Sr., a handsome and articulate lawyer, was running for president. Ferdinand was the patriarch of the Marcos clan, Bongbong's dad the first in the family to run for president. He campaigned 24 hours a day. I've done away with a vicious habit of sleeping. He was backed by his wife, Imelda, a national style icon. Mrs. Marcos also sings. Now, Philippines politics in the 60s were pretty rough. National elections in the Philippines are probably the jazziest, the most uninhibited, the most corrupt, and probably the most violent of any election campaigns I've ever heard of. A smear campaign was running against Ferdinand Marcos and it was next level. Why is it being done, do you think? Because they have no issues against me. Mm. Valid issues. Ads are running accusing him of straight up murder. I personally believe that Mr. Ferdinand Marcos killed my father. It was very Inigo Montoya. Hello. Marcos was never proven to be a murderer, but the Philippines was full of gun violence. It really was like the Wild West. You see, about 25% of the people of Manila carry a gun. Outside of drunkenness, the armed citizen of Manila is the biggest headache to the police force here, particularly around election time, when tempers are just a little on edge and trigger fingers itchier than usual. Ferdinand Marcos promised to tackle all of this. He was confident of winning. I think it's going to be a landslide. And it was. But there was one part of the Philippines which really seemed to not like him, the southern island of Mindanao. This island, home to one in three Filipinos, is the place where the dispute between the Dutertes and Marcoses took root. Like elsewhere, the nation's deep south is full of problems and lovely women. That's ABC reporter Frank Bennett there. Yowza! What the Deep South had, apart from problems and lovely women, apparently, was 
a lot of Muslims. For the most part, the Muslims are poor peasants and fishermen. Despite the Philippines being majority Catholic, Mindanao and the smaller islands surrounding it were majority Muslim. But for the last 80 years, huge quantities of Christians have been moving there, leading to conflict. Their problems began in earnest after the Second World War, when Christian settlers in the northern Philippines began to move south in search of land and brought with them a culture that had no place for Islamic traditions. Ferdinand Marcos had polled poorly in Mindanao, so to win over the locals, he invited the Mindanao governor to join his cabinet. The governor's name was Vicente Duterte. It was the first time the two families came together. Vicente Duterte moved to Manila, leaving his wife Soledad to look after their five children, including their son, Rodrigo. Now, remember, Rodrigo would go on to become the president of the Philippines. But back then, Roddy Duterte was a brat. A son of a successful politician who had a team of bodyguards around at all times to keep him safe. The streets of Davao City were a violent and dangerous place, and young Rodrigo loved it. Instead of speaking like the privileged boy he was, he picked up the vernacular of a bogoy, a hoodlum. It's kind of difficult to pin down what Rodrigo's life was like back then, because the stories he tells are often questionable. His rebellious streak through his teens and twenties is part of his legend. He claims to have stabbed someone to death before he turned 16. He claims to have shot someone who bullied him at university. I am back. <laughs> but fellow students say that this never happened. Rodi Duterte's father died while serving in Ferdinand Marcos's cabinet, and the Duterte family drifted out of the national political eye for nearly two decades. During those two decades, Ferdinand Marcos let his presidential power go to his head. It was 1972. The democratically elected Marcos, near the end of his term in office, has staged a revolution against his own administration and established for himself a new kind of Asian dictatorship. Ferdinand Marcos declared martial law and established an authoritarian regime with him at the head. He has proclaimed himself president, prime minister, chief of the armed forces and one man government all in one. Criticism of his actions and his regime has been outlawed. His political opponents have been jailed. Elections have been canceled. His regime's treatment of political prisoners was brutal. They give a rundown of the variety of tortures. Application of lighted cigarettes to various parts of the body, including the ear and the genital area. Yes, that is a young, hot, long-haired Kerry O'Brien speaking. ...with bullets inserted between them. And last but not least, pressing a hot iron against the soles of the foot. On the back of this repression, Ferdinand Marcos was establishing his family as something like a royal family. His wife, Imelda, an appointed cabinet minister, has been campaigning vigorously. She's also the governor of Manila. The minimum age of candidates has been reduced to allow the president's son, who's 21, to contest unopposed a vice governorship in his home province. That son is Ferdinand Marcos Jr., best known as Bongbong. Bong. But over the course of just four days, it all came crashing down. In February 1986, millions of Filipinos overthrew the Marcos regime. We are all very happy to announce that it is confirmed Mr. Marcos has left this country. Marcos and his family fled to Hawaii. It was found that they had robbed the country of billions of dollars. While the country suffered, the Marcoses siphoned millions from foreign aid and loan funds to support their extravagant lifestyle. When the presidential palace was opened up to the public, the size of Imelda Marcos's wardrobe became legendary. 3,000 pairs of shoes and gowns, 35 racks full. One of the leaders of the anti-Marcos movement in Mindanao was Rodrigo Duterte's mother. As Filipinos sifted through the loot and plunder of the Marcos regime, she was encouraged to get into politics, but she said that she'd prefer her son Rodrigo to do it. The Duterte family were back on the rise. In the first elections after Marcos left the country, Rodrigo Duterte was elected mayor of Davao. Rodrigo was the polar opposite of the Marcoses. Instead of collecting jewels and shoes, he collected guns. He was mayor for over 22 years and his time in office was 
wild. He had a gold-plated revolver on his desk. He was almost always in aviator sunglasses. He took the toughest possible stance on crime, encouraging vigilante groups, usually made up of off-duty policemen, to go around killing drug addicts. Now, one thing you need to know about Rodrigo Duterte is he loves jokes. He loves saying things that sound like threats or admissions of serious crimes. I am back. And then either he or more often one of his aides will come out later and say that it was a joke. Like the time he boasted that he would himself ride around on his motorbike killing drug dealers to show the police what he wanted them to do. But in Davo, I used to do it personally, just to show to the guys that if I can do it, why can't you? Ha ha. The devoured death squad seemed not to realise that the mayor was joking and would post pictures of their dead victims online. Nobody knows how many petty criminals, drug pushers, drug addicts and street children were killed, but estimates coalesce around the thousand mark. After two decades as mayor, Duterte had basically made himself the king of Davao. His children were the vice mayors, his family has a personal arsenal of more than 600 guns. And their message to the Philippines was, we have solved the crime problem. Davao City, once the murder capital of the country, is now safe. Actual data to back that up is pretty hard to come by, but it worked well as a propaganda line. People started encouraging Duterte to run for president and to take his policies national. All this while, the Marcos family were trying to regain their former power. In 1989, Bongbong Bong Marcos announced that his father, the exiled dictator Ferdinand, was dead. God has taken this great man from our midst to a better place, more deserving of his presence. Bongbong Bong and his mother returned to the Philippines to a warm reception. Imelda Marcos was mobbed on her arrival. There's speculation she plans to rebuild her late husband's political dynasty and may even be aiming for the presidency. Marcos's departure had delivered democracy to the Philippines, but not prosperity. Stagnant growth through the 90s led some to miss the Marcos years. Imelda and Bongbong Bong tried to capitalise on this. Both became members of parliament soon after returning home, and Imelda ran unsuccessfully for president. By 2016, the reputation of the Marcoses had recovered to the extent that there were two clear power bases in the Philippines. The Marcoses held sway in the north and the Dutertes in the south. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Manila, where we lay our scene. The Montagues and the Capulets of the Philippines were destined to become allies or enemies. Rodrigo Duterte was elected president in 2016 and both sides began to see value in an alliance. In 2022, as Rodrigo Duterte approached his term limit, it was announced that the two families would unite. Now that is catchy. Bongbong Bong Marcos ran for president and won, with Rodrigo Duterte's daughter Sara as his running mate. The two clans united. But there's a problem. And it's their past. International investigators and prosecutors are chasing President Bongbong Bong Marcos, trying to recoup the billions of dollars plundered by his father, Ferdinand. Why wouldn't you want all of that money back in the hands of the Filipino people? Any money that you find is yours. And finish. And we, we, everything was taken from us. Bongbong Bong is trying to get people to forget this by portraying himself as being a much less chaotic, repressive and corrupt leader than his father or Rodrigo Duterte. Speaking of Duterte, well, it turns out if you spend 30 years making jokes like this... If I have to kill you, I will kill you, personally. While vigilante groups are killing tens of thousands of your citizens, international human rights groups will struggle to see the funny side. Woke, humorless investigators from the International Criminal Court in The Hague have now spent years gathering evidence about Rodrigo Duterte's time in office. 
both Bong Bong and Duterte need the other family, whichever one's in power, to use the power of the presidency to protect them. All of this has put President Bong Bong Marcos in a tough spot. He's doing his best to run a responsible, fair, stable, not insane government, and there's pressure on him to hand Duterte over to stand trial for crimes against an... Oh, let me just check here. Ah, yes, against uh, humanity. Which brings us to today. The two clans are warring, threatening each other, calling each other drug addicts, and generally making a spectacle out of politics. Bong Bong is still the president, and Sara Duterte is his vice president, and yet the sparring goes on. The latest barb in their fighting comes in the form of a threat. For the last couple of months, Rodrigo Duterte has been making more jokes about leading a secession movement in Mindanao and splitting it and its 27 million citizens off from the rest of the Philippines. Ha ha! Hilarious. But is it really a joke? Domestically, the country became the fastest growing economy in Southeast Asia last year. Internationally, the United States and Australia see the Philippines as one of their most important Asian allies. The Philippines is a country where politics and family are deeply, deeply intertwined. The country's stability relies on this family feud staying relatively civil. 